Everyone likes the story of rags to riches. But for Jesus, taking on human flesh means his story is riches to rags. The Son of God's arrival in Bethlehem fulfilled countless prophecies and drew the attention of legions of angels. There's a good reason why our calendars pivot from B.C. to A.D. at the time of his birth. For the details, stay with us. From the Moody Church in Chicago, this is Running to Win with Dr. Erwin Lutzer, whose clear teaching helps us make it across the finish line. We're in a series on Christ among other gods, showing why Christ is supreme. Today, Dr. Lutzer begins a message on Christ's extraordinary birth. I think that all of us remember the story, the tragic story that was on the news some time ago about a grandmother who had the responsibility of caring for her little two-year-old granddaughter. And the little girl fell into a swimming pool. The grandmother did not know how to swim. But in absolute desperation, she hopped into the pool to try to rescue the little one. And some time later, both bodies were pulled from the swimming pool. You know, if you're in the middle of an ocean and you don't know how to swim and you're beginning to go under, you need somebody to rescue you, but it can't just be somebody who is willing to rescue you. It has to be someone who has the ability to rescue you. You need someone who isn't in the same predicament as you are. You need somebody who is not subject to those waves in the same way that you are, someone who himself does not need to be rescued. That's what you need when you're going under. And the same is true when it comes to sin and its power and its awful consequences. To be rescued from sin and its consequences, you need as someone who is able to reach down to rescue you who himself is not a sinner. Because when you're going down, you don't need somebody who is in the same mess that you are. You need as someone who is above the situation. Which leads me to the question, who is Jesus Christ anyway? Who is he? Well, there have been two views throughout history. One is that he is just a mere man. Remember when Scorsese made his movie, The Last Temptation of Christ? He said, I tried to create a Christ who in some sense is like the guy down the street. Well, the problem is that I am a sinner, and I need to be reconciled to God, and I need more help than the guy who's down the street is able to give me. I need is somebody who is not in my predicament. Historic Christianity has always held that Jesus Christ, though he is fully man, he is also fully God. And because he is fully God, he is different from all humanity, though he has some similarities. He is in all points like as we are, except that he is sinless and that he is joined to a divine nature. And because of that, he is a perfect, sinless Savior. And that's why he's the only one who can rescue us from the consequences and the effects of sin. When I was at the Parliament of World Religions, I decided to go through those booths, those display areas, and some of you know that I spent several hours there. But one of the things I decided to do one morning is to go in search of a sinless Savior. I thought to myself as I walked down those aisles with all of the displays and the books and the videotapes and the 105 different faiths represented, I thought, I'm going to find me a sinless Savior. So I walked over to where the Buddhists were, and after engaging them and asking them what they believed, I asked the question, I said, did Buddha claim to be sinless? And they said, no, he was enlightened, but he wasn't sinless. He gathered some people around him and taught them the eight ways, taught them that the things that we see outside of ourselves are not the real reality. We must go within and we must meditate and we must seek to change ourselves. Buddha, it is said, was enlightened, but he did not claim that he was sinless. He died still seeking more light. So I thought, well, what about the Hindus? And I walked over, and there was a Hindu swami behind the desk there. And 
behind his display booth, and I said, uh, could you tell me, in all of the Hindu traditions, with all of the gurus and all of the teachers, did any one of them claim to be sinless? And his answer was very direct. He said, no. In fact, he said, if you ever find someone who claims to be sinless, he is not a Hindu. Uh, well, that's interesting. So I walked over to the booth where you have the Baha'i faith, and I thought, Baha'u'llah, I wonder if he was sinless. No, he claimed that some of his teachings were better than those of Jesus Christ. And by the way, you know that that's what the Baha'i faith believes, that Jesus is one step in the evolutionary cycle and Baha'u'llah is now a more modern, updated version of religion. And that's a matter, incidentally, that we are going to take up in a subsequent message to show you how to answer those who think that Christ is one prophet among many in the evolutionary spiral. No, he claimed that some of his teachings perhaps were perfect, but he was not sinless. He never claimed it. So I thought, well, what about Muhammad? I walked over to the Muslims and talked to them about Muhammad. And I said, by the way, did Muhammad claim to be sinless? And I already knew the answer because in the Quran he claims that he needed forgiveness. And if you have studied his life, you'll know how accurate that really turns out to be. And so I asked them and they said, no, he did not claim sinlessness. He himself needed to be forgiven. Turn where I will. I could not find a sinless prophet, much less a sinless savior. Ah, oh, you turn to the Bible, and what a different picture you have of Jesus Christ. He's standing there with all of his accusers, those who hate him and want him to be crucified, and he looks at them, and he looks at them in the eye and says to them, which of you convinces me of sin? Is there any one of you that wants to point out a fault? And they answered him, not a word. He said to his disciples regarding Satan, he says, The prince of this world comes, but he has nothing in me. There's no commonality between me and Satan. Judas said of him, I have betrayed innocent blood. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. The Apostle Paul said of him, he knew 